Today we're going to talk a little bit about water quality. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking about um, what we look for in water quality and what are indicators of good and bad water quality um, and things that can either harm or be of benefit. So these are pretty much the main things that you'll talk about when you're talking about water quality. So runoff, sedimentation, dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, um, and then pesticides, um, hazardous waste, oil, grease, detergents, and lead. Pretty much everything from like pesticides down, um, just all of the chemicals and stuff you can find, but like on their own, they're um, not really necessarily independent categories of each other because they kind of be tend to be grouped together because a lot of them are um, forced into the water through runoff. And so we're going to talk about the different sources of water pollution. So um, primarily we have point and non-point sources. Um, with point sources, it's just you can tell immediately where the pollution is coming from. So when you have a company with like a wastewater um, permit and they can just dump their pollutants directly into a waterway, that's a point source. Um, any kind of dumping like that, when you have like cruise ships and boats that are dumping waste um, into the ocean, it's the same idea. It's just straight from the source into the waterway. And then with non-point sources, um, pretty much runoff, everything is a bunch of different pollutants are gathered on land. And then when it rains, they're all washed into the water. So you can't really tell where exactly these contaminants come from because they do have a wide range of sources and they're all just coming in through runoff. So it's really um, non-point sources. It's a lot more difficult to mitigate these because it's difficult to pinpoint exactly where the source of uh, this pollution is. And I have a little graphic off to the right that just kind of um, shows the different like um, point versus non-point uh, sources of pollution. Right. We're going to talk, off, talk a little bit about runoff. Um, everything on the ground can be swept into a waterway when it rains um, because of runoff. And runoff does occur naturally when the um, ground is fully saturated. The rain is just going to run off the top. Um, but this is made a lot worse in really urbanized areas because the ground can't absorb any more of that water like it would have been able to before because there's concrete there. Um, so this makes the problem of runoff a lot worse because everything we put on our ground is just washed straight into the ocean. So like we have a lot of fertilizers that we use in yards, pesticides and herbicides. Um, and then all of our litter, um, oil and grease and gas from cars, all of this stuff is swept away by runoff straight into our different waterways. Um, beaches tend to be closed after heavy rain events because of the severity of runoff in highly urbanized areas. So really just everything on the ground will find its way into the ocean because of runoff or into mm -hmm. other aquatic systems like yours. We also have sediment pollution. Sediment pollution is definitely um, the most common kind of pollutant in freshwater um, systems and it's listed by the EPA, EPA as the most common pollutant. Um, it's severely accelerated by humans through construction and development. Um, so we account for about 70% of the sediment pollution and runoff that is produced. It causes $16 billion in environmental damage annually. Um, you wouldn't really think of sediment as something, I feel like off the top of your head, that would really damage um, ecosystems because it, it is fairly, it's not incredibly difficult to um, remove. However, with the organisms that live in these waterways, um, you can't see the food as well, when the water is made really murky, murky um, it clogs the gills of fish and then photosynthesis doesn't happen as easily because the light is blocked by all of the sediment. So it's really disruptive to the ecosystem itself. So it's not as much of a problem of removing it to make it drinkable. Um, it's more of an issue of affecting the function of an aquatic ecosystem. Um, so yeah. Next we can talk about dissolved oxygen. Um, this isn't, obviously it's not a pollutant, but it's a really good indicator of the health of an aquatic system. So you can see how much damage is or isn't being done um, to a system based on the amount of dissolved oxygen. So in areas that are really urbanized and have a lot of runoff, you tend to get a lot of fertilizers. 
um, in the water and this allows for algal growth, um, which will decrease the dissolved oxygen. So by measuring dissolved oxygen, you can tell a lot about what's happening within the, within the ecosystem. Um, the important thing to keep in mind when you're using dissolved oxygen as an indicator is that it fluctuates season, seasonally in some areas. And so it's not something that's always going to be consistent. So you have to look in, at a change in like the pattern overall from year to year, as opposed to a change from month to month. And then off to the right, I have a graph of uh, the range of tolerance that fish have for different levels of dissolved oxygen, just so you can get like a concept of how much um, you need to sustain a population of fish. Um, and pH is another big one. Um, a lot of aquatic organisms don't have a great tolerance for a lot of variance in pH. So um, having a, cons a consistent pH is really important. Um, variance in pH does indi indicate that there is pollution um, and environmental disruption because pH does tend to be fairly consistent um, in an aquatic system. So high pH, um, and water can corrode and dissolve metals and that's important in drinking water when you have you know all of your water is running through pipes and if pH is too hot too high then it's going to mess up your pipes and then you're going to have a higher quantity of metals in your water because they're being dissolved as the water runs through them and then in areas with water on um, that has a low pH it requires a lot more chlorine to effect effectively disinfect the water and so the city will have to pump more chlorine into the drinking water to effectively um, make it safe for drinking. And off to the right again, I have another this graph of uh, pH and what we expect um, to happen to the fish populations at certain pHs. So when we're around three, like the pH of vinegar, that's where most fish can't survive past that point. And then above about eight, um, is unsafe for a lot of fish as well. So the best, the best ideal range for fish tends to be between six and eight. A lot of places are about 7.5 for aquatic systems. Um, hazardous chemicals in our water come from a wide variety of places. We use chemicals in pretty much every aspect of our daily lives, um, specifically with like, um, yards and lawns. We have a lot of pesticides and herbicides, uh, insecticides, stuff that's meant to kill other stuff that then rinses into our water that we then drink later down the line. Um, factory runoff, all the different chemicals that go into production of different items, um, cleaners and detergents, um, dish detergents, and then laundry detergents, bathroom cleaners. It's just a very wide variety of chemicals that are difficult um, the exact cause health-wise or the exact effect health-wise of a lot of these chemicals is not entirely understood. Um, so what we, we generally know <laughs> is that we don't want these things in our water, but we're not really sure what safe levels for a lot of these hazardous chemicals are, um, which makes it even more difficult to regulate them because a lot of research hasn't yet been done um, as to what quantities can be sustained and human health not affected. But when we talk about um, contamination by chemicals, you either have acute effects or chronic effects. So basically short-term effects versus long-term effects. Um, acute effects happen within like days or hours and it's drinking water that is very highly contaminated. Generally speaking, if you have water that's contaminated just once or twice, um, you're like, you're gonna be fine. Your immune system works well, unless you're um, predisposed and more sensitive um, to pollutants then your body can typically, you know, continue to function as normal after clearing the contaminant out. Um, chronic effects is just after years and years of drinking very contaminated water. Um, you can get cancer, liver and kidney problems, and then reproductive difficulties. Um, I also read something that like with PFAs, one of the effects, chronic effects can be like a lower infant birth rate. So obviously there are a lot of really negative health effects and the the level of these chemicals at which a lot of these effects happen hasn't really been determined yet. So we don't know what a safe level for these chemicals is, which is what makes them so concerning. So next I'm going to talk a little, about, a little bit about PFAs. Um, Wilmington has had a lot of interaction with PFAs, so 
definitely something that is important to understand living where we do. So these are man-made chemicals and they're very em environmentally persistent. Um, they do not break down and if they do, it takes a very, very long time. They will continue to accumulate over time. PFAs are found in pretty much everything. Um, I was surprised looking at sources of PS PFAs, how many I found. Um, materials that food are packed in can contain PFAs and then food can be contaminated by water and soil that has PA PFAs in it. Um, household cleaning products, pretty much nonstick things and like stain repellents. Um, pretty interesting that like waxy water repellent surfaces tend to be um, high in PFAs. And then also firefighting foams. I found out that um, a lot of like the firefighting foam causes a lot of soil contamination for PFAs, which I thought was really interesting because obviously that's something that would be difficult to find in like an alternative method for a lot of firefighting foams because they are really effective. Um, they're also found in like workplaces and factories, again, just because these are areas that use a lot of chemicals and they're found in drinking water when the water source is polluted and they're found in the organisms that live in contaminated water. Um, Studies have indicated that they can cause cancer, um, low infant birth rate, and um, problems with infant birth weight as well, reproductive and developmental issues, and then liver and kidney problems again, and a weakened immune system. So these are universally accepted to be negative for health, but um, guidelines, they're currently still unregulated. There are goals that um, North Carolina has for the degree of contamination we would like to get below, but we don't actually have a scientifically um, double-checked number for, you know, what is a safe amount of these to have in our water, which is very scary. <laughs> and then I have a little map that shows where PFA contamination in America is. And you can see if it's drinking water on military sites and then other sources. So you can see a lot around the Great Lakes and then in North Carolina, you can see us down in that bottom corner, <laughs> which is great. But um, I was surprised the degree of contamination up towards the Great Lakes because I feel like when we talk about PFAs and then Gen X, we talk about Wilmington a lot, um, but I wasn't aware of the extent in other areas as well. So in Wilmington specifically, Cape Fear River was contaminated by the Keymores plant in Fayetteville um, with a wide variety of PFAs. People talk about Gen X a lot specifically um, but this is not the only pollutant that was released into our water. By the this company had a major spill and then they had their waste discharge permit revoked, which did help um, with the degree of contamination not increasing further from there. However, these things are really difficult to remove from the water and so that's been a problem that um, we have run into locally and then the company has run into as well in trying to compensate for the damages. So we hear a lot about Gen X, but other PFAs um, are also unregulated and we don't know the full extent of their health effects. And they can't be removed through traditional water purification methods, which means that we have to find alternative ways um, to make our water safe enough to drink. Um, a lot of the information about the contamination of Wilmington was First um, studied in 2016 and the public became aware around the summer of 2017. So since then we have increased or decreased the concentration substantially, but because the effects are not fully understood, it's still not something people are comfortable, comfortable with and most people avoid the tap water. And here's some graphs I pulled from the 20, or not graphs, here's some tables I pulled from the 2019 um, water quality report. So you can kind of see off to the left, Gen X and then some other kinds of PFAs and then what um, the goal that North Carolina has, has set for how many parts per trillion we would like to have. So according to the report from 2019, it says that the average water had 11 parts per trillion and the goal is under 140. Um, I thought that was interesting because I thought it was a lot higher at that time, but that is what we had in the 2019 report. And then off to the right, we have just the general characteristics of the water in Wilmington. So hardness, alkalinity, conductivity, etc. 
So to remove PFAs, um, there are four main methods that we can use. Granular activated carbon and powdered activated carbon are pretty simu similar. Um, you just use carbon to remove the PFAs from the water, either in a powdered form or just in a more granular form. Um, but these are both effective ways to remove PFAs. So the carbon just sticks to them and then um, they can be passed through a membrane and the carbon and the PFAs will be removed. We also have ion exchange resins. So they're just small beads that are made of hydrocarbons and they work like magnets. Again, the same idea, the PFAs will stick to these little resins and then they can be removed from the water that way. And then reverse osmosis is a really big one. A lot of people in Wilmington, um, my friends that have lived here for a while have reverse osmosis systems installed in their houses so they can just purify the water there, um, which is probably one of the most popular ways to treat um, Gen X in our water here. And off to the right, that's a picture of a home RO system. They do take up a lot of space and they can be pretty expensive. There are several ways we can prevent water contamination. We need to stop allowing these chemicals to be dumped into waterways in the first place. A, a really big problem is that we're willing to put these things in the water before we know the health risks of them and then they're nearly impossible to get out. And we dump so much stuff into our waterways just because we feel like it's large enough to dilute it to a safe level, but that's not what we've seen time and time again. We also need to re reduce the quantity of impermeable surfaces um, in really urbanized areas without that soil and with all of the concrete and asphalt um, runoff is made a lot more severe, which has really um, affected our water quality negatively. Also reducing factory emissions, air pollution can affect water quality because of the creation of smog and acid rain that will then affect the pH of the water. Um, Factories also use local waterways as ways to um, cool hot systems a lot of the time. So what you'll have is cold, cold water will be popped, uh, pumped into a um, factory and then the equipment will be cooled with the water and then the water will be um, dumped back out into the, um, the lake or res reservoir. And so this causes the temperature of the lake to rise over time, which negatively affects the organisms living there because they're not adjusted to these um, warmer temperatures. And this also happens where just um, water is taken in from a lake or reservoir and then is used for something and then is pumped back out. Um, so either way, these, it's not good for the organisms there because they're not able to adapt to the change fast enough to survive. Another way to prevent water contamination is to not flush things that you can put in a wastebasket. This is a really big one. A lot of like, if it's not toilet paper, it really shouldn't be in there. Um, plastics and just anything else that goes in the toilet that's like not supposed to be there. Um, it's difficult to remove in wastewater treatment plants, so it makes it more complicated and it um, overall affects our water quality negatively. And here are my sources. These are, um, if any of you guys want um, the PowerPoint for the sources, there's, it's a lot of um, really cool information. It's really interesting. There's a lot of information here too. A lot of it's just good stuff to know being in Wilmington with the